Good evening. I'm Jim Zirin, and you are watching The Digital Age. With us tonight is Richard Haas. Richard Haas is the president of the Council on Foreign Relations. He has recently written an intriguing article in American Interest magazine in which he elaborates a new foreign policy doctrine for the 21st century. He calls the doctrine restoration. Restoration means we should concentrate on American domestic interests, such as our economy and our fiscal stability, and elevate these concerns, perhaps over indulgence in foreign wars of choice, as we experienced in Iraq and more recently Afghanistan. Richard, we're delighted to have you with us to discuss these issues and to welcome you back to the digital age. Good to be back. Now, first, you wrote, quote, the number one foreign policy challenge facing the United States today is what is going on in the United States. Our management of the economy, our aging infrastructure, our poor K-12 to educational system, and our political divisions at home. Does the Restoration Doctrine address these concerns? Well, absolutely, and as you made clear in your introduction, in two ways. One is we've got to be very careful about what you might call discretionary foreign policy. Uh, massive resource, resource commitments where our interests are less than vital or we have other policies that could take care of matters. And then secondly, we really do need to address the foundations of American power here at home. And it is everything from our human capital, which gets at immigration policy, and it gets at the quality of our, our public schools, our physical capital, which are above all infrastructure, energy, and so forth, and then our fiscal situation. We simply can't run up deficits a uh, trillion dollars or more a year. We can't have this cumulative debt. This will ultimately erode the foundations of, of American power, which isn't bad for our society, but also it will undermine our ability to act and lead in the world. Well. Part of uh, uh, what you uh, argue for is, of course, a reduction in domestic spending. Does it also involve a curtailment of military spending? In part, we get a, an immediate curtailment by having left Iraq and by beginning to draw down in Afghanistan. I would probably do a somewhat quicker drawdown, but that will, get, that will save us together over $100 billion a year. The core defense budget is, is in the area of $500 billion a year, and there, there actually isn't too much to cut. I think we can cut it slightly. The President and the Secretary of Defense have put forth a strategy of about 8% cuts. I, I wouldn't go any further than that. And if anything, uh, what I would do is continue to make sure that we had what we needed in the way of air and naval forces, because that will help us most in the Pacific and Asian theater, and that's ultimately where the history of the 21st century is going to be decided, as opposed to the greater Middle East, which is where we've been making our major investments, as you suggested, in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, uh, that's the pivot toward Asia that uh, exactly. the Secretary of State talked about. I'm not, I'm not uh, too happy with the word pivot. That suggests something sharper, but it is something of an adjustment. We want to dial down to some extent in the greater Middle East, and we want to dial up in the Asia Pacific. Think about it, you, know, you have China, Japan, Russia, India, the Southeast Asian countries, Australia, that's where the energy is. That's where most of the world's GDP is going to come from. That's the part of the world the United States needs to keep stable where we have important alliance commitments as well. But it can't mean abandoning one interest for another. Absolutely, and you know, that's why I'm not too comfortable with the word pivot. It's a little bit sharper. Basketball term. Uh, exactly. Uh, that's why adjustment, or if you prefer, rheostats, to get really wonky on this for mm -hmm. a second. So we want to slightly reduce our emphasis, particularly when it comes to discretionary wars. I think when history is written and people will look at what the United States chose to do uh, in 2003 in Iraq and chose to do in the buildup in Afghanistan under Mr. Obama, in both cases I believe historians are going to judge those decisions to have been ill-advised. It was simply a much greater expenditure of human life of money, of a military effort, and of attention than our interests there warranted. We could have gotten, I believe, perfectly acceptable results at far, far, far smaller or lower levels of effort. You write that the goal should be to uh, uh, cut the budget uh, $250 billion to $300 billion sure. uh, a year. So uh, we would then be able to balance the budget in how long, five years? Uh, roughly, if you're talking about trillion and a half uh, dollar you know, trillion five hundred billion uh, deficits, probably a little bit lower than that, but over four or five years. And I'm looking at something like, and it's based on, upon another piece I did with Roger Altman, the former Deputy Treasury Secretary, some sort of a ratio of roughly three dollars 
in, in spending cuts to every one dollar in, in, in tax increases. So are you saying in five years we would have restored the situation so then we would be uh, poised to uh, uh, be an internationalist power again? Well, we can stay in power anyhow. That's part of the reason we can have the luxury, if you will, of restoration is there's no quote unquote peer competitor out there. Even the Chinese, who everyone talks about, have a long, long ways to go before they're ever in a position to challenge us, and that assumes that they continue on the trajectory they're on, which is not an assumption necessarily uh, that one would make. But one also has to look at more than simply our economics. We've got to deal with our schools. We've got to deal with our infrastructure. I believe we need to fix our immigration policy. So all of this will take years or even decades to play out. Well, you, uh, let's uh, compare and contrast restoration, say, with containment, a Cold War policy that lasted uh, for 50 years mm -hmm. and uh, averted, many argue, uh, a nuclear uh, holocaust. Uh, will uh, restoration last uh, 50 years? Will it take 50 years before we're restored as a, as a world power? Uh, I would hope not, and I would think not. I would, I would think it could probably done the best part in a decade, maybe a decade and a half, and gradually what I would like to do is shift to what I would call a policy of integration to essentially build international institutions and arrangements to deal with the pressing global problems of this era, dealing with energy issues, environmental issues, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, disease issues, global economic challenges. What we need to do is lash up, uh, essentially fix uh, world arrangements to deal with these challenges we want to bring in or integrate the other major players, China, Brazil, India, Russia, Europe, Japan, what have you, and that's where I would focus. I simply think we're not there yet. There's not a consensus on what needs to be doing, and many of these other countries aren't prepared to put these global interests first. So in the meantime, I actually think we have both the luxury as well as the necessity on focusing on, on restoration, on fixing our, the bases of our power. If we do that, we will be able to accomplish more, and others will have the incentive to work with us rather than to work against us. Well, integration is much uh, like what we had in the first Iraq war, where there was a cooperation of, uh, of countries and uh, we had a common interest. So it's possible we could have integration on some issues with countries and not on others, and uh, then as we move along and events overtake us, we could have integration with other countries on other issues. Exactly right, and the metaphor I use is, is, is a kind of multilateralism a la carte. You're not going to have a prefix menu that's going to work for all challenges uh, all the time. On some challenges, we might find we're able to work with these three or four countries. On other challenges, we may, in fact, be able to go to the UN Security Co uh, Council. On still others, we may have to do it largely alone or with a very small coalition of the willing. We're going to have to be very flexible, and I think that's inevitable in the era of history we're now in or, and are going to remain in for some time to come. This is an extraordinarily dynamic period of history. You mentioned containment. Containment was a rather rigid policy. It was the right policy, but it could work in part because during the Cold War, you had a fairly fixed and predictable international system. We knew who our enemies were. We knew who our friends were. We knew uh, where the problems were going to be for the most part. None of those things applies now. On uh, Certain countries can be adversaries one day and, and allies or friends uh, the next day. They can work with us on some issues and against us on others. So we're going to need a much more deft uh, foreign policy. Containment, I suppose, was uh, useful uh, as a doctrine because it defined what we stood for and what we wouldn't stand for. Uh, is uh, restoration that kind of policy? And, and also, do we need to have a foreign policy? Do we need to have a rigid doctrine mm -hmm. uh, that governs what we do in international affairs? But Containment was really what we were against. It wasn't so much what we were for, but it was, again, the appropriate policy for the era because we faced this overwhelming challenge from the Soviet Union and from international communism. It was, it was exactly right. It lasted four decades, and it succeeded. Do we need a doctrine now? Yeah, I think we do. If you have a doctrine, it's a way to prepare your public for what it is they might need to do. You have to decide, for example, what kind of assets are you going to have, unless you know what you might need to do. How is it you're supposed to make decisions, say, about military forces? These decisions can have 20, 30, 40, 50 year uh, consequences. What about where you put your economic resources? So I think, yes, you, you want to have a doctrine. You want to be prepared. You want to be predictable. You want to still defer, deter, rather, uh, your foes. I think uh, what I would call restoration is a transitional uh, doctrine. And again, what I'm hoping is it gets us to, towards integration. 
It, it builds up our power so we can do more in the world and we are in a better position to persuade others to work with us in building these global arrangements. Uh, so I actually think containment was the right doctrine for the last half of the 20th century. And I actually think restoration is the right doctrine now. It's a, tr it's a transitional doctrine for American foreign policy to rebuild our, our power. And then I would believe the, the optimal strategy for the next year would be one of, one of integration. All right, well, let's get down with it. Uh, what would uh, restoration tell us to do about Iran? Well, it's interesting. It's, mm -hmm. it's in some ways the toughest call, because Iran would be a, a war of choice, and restoration pushes back uh, against us, against wars of choice, but it doesn't mean necessarily you reject them. What I would argue in Iran right now is we don't like the idea either of an Iran with nuclear weapons. That would be incredibly risky and dangerous for the region. Nor do we like the idea necessarily of going to war against Iran. That would also be risky, dangerous, and, uh, and costly. So what I think we need to do now is to try to resolve the, the challenge through a combination of tools. One is sanctions, which we put in place. We've also got clandestine measures in place to frustrate the, the Iranian nuclear program. To what, that, what are the clandestine uh, measures? Computer viruses, uh, above all, and various. What about the assassinations? I do not believe that's something the United States is doing, uh, and I'm not sure exactly what effect on balance that, that, that is having. At the, in any case, I think that's at the, the margins. The real thing that's well, missing. Well, I know you assassinate a nuclear scientist. It's a pretty big deterrent to uh, the next nuclear well, scientist. Not if there's several thousand nuclear scientists no. uh, involved, and the program is still continuing. So we, we don't see uh, it having a, a, a decisive effect. What is missing from our policy, because the principal part of our policy now is sanctions, is a negotiating. Uh, if you will, it's the honey to complement the vinegar uh, of sanctions, where we'd essentially tell the Iranians, look, you're paying an enormous price for these sanctions. You could pay a large price if Israel or the United States were to, were to attack you. So here's a way out. Here's a way to get the sanctions reduced and to avoid uh, military attack. You would have to accept clear limits on what it is you're permitted to do in the nuclear realm, and you would have to permit intrusive inspections so we, the world community, had confidence that you were actually doing what it was you, you, you had committed to do. And I believe that we ought to put forward that kind of a proposal. I can't sit here and tell you, Jim, that they're going to accept it. The Iranians, as you know, are so divided at the top, they may reject it. But I do think there's a chance uh, this type of a negotiation could, could succeed. And if it doesn't, I much prefer to have tried it if we ultimately have to make the far-reaching decision about whether to use military force. I'd much prefer to make it having known that we exhausted the alternatives. What would the military option look like? Uh, military experts say that it would take the United States 30 days of concentrated bombing to destroy the uh, nuclear installations if we could reach all of them. Some of them are said to be in a zone of immunity where they couldn't be attacked at all. That sounds a bit uh, high to me, and it, a lot depends upon how, you're, how elaborate you want to be, but I, I would think in a much smaller amount of time you could go after the principal uh, installations, in particular the two that are involved with uh, uranium enrichment, which are in some ways the, the most important because that's the raw material of a nuclear weapon. You might decide to go after a, a, a few others. So you're probably looking not at dozens of installations, but maybe uh, roughly four in, in, in particular. And I think that could be done in, in a relatively small amount of time. The real question is with what effect depends in part about how, what kind of munitions you use and what kind of fortifications you come up against. I think it's probably safe to say that you will achieve several years of benefit in the sense of having set back the Iranian program by, by several years. You've got to weigh that against all the costs about how Iran might retaliate, about the impact on, on energy prices, about how- Alienating the entire Iranian population. It could do that. It could cause a real rally, rally around the flag. Yeah, the flag. Destroying any uh, possibility of regime change. Those are all, look, yeah, when I used to teach foreign policy at Harvard, I used to uh, tell my students foreign policy is hard. This is hard. This is hard if you act. It's hard if you don't act. Because you know, we could sit here and discuss all the costs of an Iran that has nuclear weapons, the other countries that would perhaps want to develop them, what it would mean for crisis stability or the lack thereof in all, what's already the most unstable part of the world, how the Iranians could supply nuclear materials to a group like Hamas or Hezbollah, how Iran, which right now is a menace in a country like Syria, could become that much more menacing. There's no good options at this point. If we're forced to go to war or acquiesce to an Iranian nuclear program, each one of those is a wildly, to me, unattractive option, which is why I then keep coming back to sanctions and a diplomatic effort. It's by far the preferable option.
certainly the preferable option. Let's move on to Syria, where there's been violence uh, for uh, over a year against the existing mm -hmm. uh, regime. Uh, uh, just uh, today, there's a report that uh, two journalists, including one American, have been killed in homes and uh, a place where there has been uh, great violence. I mean, let's look at the rollout. <laughs> This was a uh, YouTube, Richard, uh, YouTube clip of a recent artillery strike against the Baba Amir neighborhood in uh, Homs. And the narrator is saying in Arabic, God is my only and best guardian. The world remains silent. Today is February 20, 2012. Uh, how do you see this situation is playing out? And uh, what would restoration say about it? This is in some ways archetypical of what we're seeing in the Middle East and around the world, where some of the most pressing challenges happen within states rather than uh, between states. Uh, what it's, if nothing else is done, if nothing else were to be done, you're likely to have the Syrian government under Mr. Assad hang in there. Uh, the security forces, I believe, would, would hang tough. They're, they're clearly willing to kill their own people with uh, alacrity. I know five, six, seven thousand Syrians have already uh, lost their lives. Uh, what I, I don't think the United States necessarily has vital national interests there. I don't believe also it's, it's easy to design a policy uh, that, that would work from the outside. So I think there's really two choices at this point. One is to try to weaken the Syrian regime, and that seems to me to involve continued economic sanctions, increase the sanctions where you can, some diplomacy to try to get military uh, units to defect, try to distance the Russians from them, get the Europeans, the Turks, and the Arabs to put more, more, more pressure on them, or to allow arms to reach the opposition. And to I would allow, or would we supply arms to the dissidents? Would you say I, I would not. Uh, we don't need to, first of all. There's more than enough arms in that part of the world. Second of all, who are the dissidents? It's, it's, it's actually erroneous to speak about a Syrian opposition, as if, if it were one group. You have multiple oppositions, political and, and military. I would only favor the United States getting uh, involved as you, the way you suggest, and I'm not sure even then, if we had a unified opposition that we actually knew what they stood for and what they would do if they ever came to power. One of the lessons of Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, all these situations is you've got to, you can't just think one move ahead. Uh, you've got to think th several moves maybe ahead. Maybe a decade ahead. And maybe a decade again ahead. So you've got to think about what, what's the alternative? What, is act what are you setting in motion? And right now, for example, in the opposition, you have various al-Qaeda units coming in from places like Iraq into Syria. Ironically enough, the opposite of what happened mm -hmm. years ago when al-Qaeda types went from Syria into Iraq. What are they going to want? The Muslim Brotherhood is now very active in the Syrian National Council. What is going to be their agenda? So before you start intervening, particularly with military force, you really have got to ask yourself, what kinds of scenarios are you likely to, to be setting in motion? And are you sure, as bad as certain situations are, that you're going to end up with something that is, that is demonstrably and enduringly better? You've really got to think several moves ahead. And uh, I worry, because on many, many occasions in this part of the world, I believe the United States has not thought through nearly enough about the aftermaths. The devil you know may be better th than the devil you don't know. Or there might be alternatives to both devils, and you've got to ask yourself, how do you come up with the least bad uh, situation? Is an armed approach, is one that essentially escalates the military uh, dynamic here, is that likely to give us an outcome that we want? Might we do better with increased economic pressure, some diplomatic initiatives, and so forth? And again, in any case, I don't see a, a military intervention that, I could, that could be designed that would really work here, uh, anything like an acceptable uh, uh, cost. And this part of the world does not lack for arms. So I don't think you really need the United States as an arms supplier here. And what about Egypt? Uh, you mentioned the Muslim Brotherhood. We had two United States senators over there trying to uh, negotiate the release of six Americans who have been detained, uh, the meeting with the Muslim Brotherhood kind of coming out of the meeting saying, well, the Muslim Brotherhood ain't so bad. Uh, how do you see that as playing out? And what would restoration say we should be doing? Well, again, uh, in Egypt, what, what you see is the limits to American or anybody uh, on the outside, their, their, their influence. It also tells you that ousting the old regime 
is in some ways the least difficult part. Putting something in that, that last that's demonstrably better is the, the hardest part. It underscores the lesson that democracy is about a lot more than, than elections. It's about constitutions. It's about checks and balances. It's about the rule of law. It's about a culture of compromise. We see very little of that. So what I, what I would say is with Egypt, the United States ought to be very conditional in its support. We, o we only ought to be extending various forms of economic support if the Egyptians meet certain criteria. And if, for example, they make it impossible for democracy groups to operate, or worse yet, they imprison uh, these Americans, then uh, there ought to be consequences. We ought not to be giving unconditional support to Egypt or anybody else. Well, should United States senators uh, be going over there to meet with uh, Field Marshal Tantawi and uh, talking about uh, a deal on uh, basically what are hostages? And uh, is, I mean, is that good foreign policy? Look, Egypt's a third, you know, roughly of the Arab world, 85 million people or so. Uh, we don't want to see Egypt fall into the abyss, and economically it could in, in several months, given the economic mismanagement, the loss of investment, the loss of uh, tourism, and the dwindling down of, of foreign exchange. Uh, Reserves. So and they could lose U.S. aid if they don't release the right, which is which the is not Chinese. which is not central to their economy, no. but it's obviously central to the uh, military as an institution. And it would be another psychological blow. It, it would make Egypt uh, much less of a destination, shall we say, for, for dollars from from other sources. So I, I think whether it's Congress or the State Department, we ought to be involved there. But we ought to be very clear. Here's what we want to see. Here's the consequences positively if you do it, negatively if you don't. It's your choice. You're a sovereign country. You make your own decisions, but we too are a sovereign country, and we are not going to give you uh, any more than we're going to give Pakistan or anybody else a blank check of unconditional support. Is it wise for us uh, to be uh, granting uh, uh, visas and financing NGOs that are going over there with the avowed purpose of undermining the Egyptian government? Well, I would not say that's their avowed purpose. Their avowed purpose is promoting civil society, promoting uh, democracy, and if that's their avowed purpose, sure, we ought to be in involved in that. I don't think we ought to be, uh, in most cases, undermining governments unless there are governments that we've determined we want to see undermined and that when we're confident we can help uh, engineer something better in its place. What should we be doing to engage China under a restoration doctrine? Well, we're, we're actually doing a lot of it. Economically, we're in dealing with the Chinese on all sorts of issues, from trade to, to investment to currency uh, issues. We ought to be talking to the Chinese about regional security challenges, such as the, which we are, the Korean Peninsula. The United States and China, under consistent with either with an integration doctrine, for sure, we ought to be talking about how we deal with global challenges, whether it's dealing with climate issues or energy issues, or how do we deal, say, with situations in the, the greater Middle East. The fact that China recently vetoed a UN resolution that would, put, would have placed greater pressure on Syria shows how far apart the United States and China still are about what to do with certain regional and, and global challenges. But under a restoration doctrine also, again, the best thing we could do is put our economic house in order, put our domestic house in order. Then we deal with China from a position of strength that, in turn, I believe, will encourage uh, responsible Chinese behavior. So restoration isn't isolationism. Oh, meaning, hardly. And no. it's not the old America first. Absolutely not. We, we can't be isolationist in a global world. We don't want to be. But we do have to be selective. And a public policy, at the end of the day, is about priorities. And I would simply say we're at a moment in our own history where we have both the luxury and the necessity of getting our domestic house in order with all that that entails. It doesn't mean ignoring the world. We're still going to be spending $500 billion a year on defense. That's hardly isolationism. We have major treaty commitments. We're not going to uh, abandon them. We are properly concerned about the Iranian nuclear program. So it's not an either or. It's not whether you have a foreign policy or you don't. It's how much and what kind of a foreign policy versus how much and what kind of domestic policy. And that's what restoration is about. Well, President Obama famously said, quote, America, it is time to focus on nation building here at home. Is that uh, restoration? In principle, the question now is whether he and others follow well, through in practice. Well, do you think he's done it over the, the last four years? Uh, no. And that's... Oh, and in what respect? Uh, we haven't fixed our, we, our economy. We, we avoid going over the brink in 2008 and 2009. What we haven't done is put ourselves on anything like a sustainable trajectory in our fiscal situation. We've got to get our spending uh, and our debt under control. We've done nothing uh, to improve our, our immigration system, legal immigration. We want to increase the number of highly talented people who can come here. We've done very little to improve our infrastructure. 
we've probably done the most in the area of education, but the, the gap between what we've done and what we need to do is, is enormous. Plus overseas, what, one thing the president did that was very inconsistent with the policy of restoration was the ramping up of the American involvement in Afghanistan. Which in I 2009, yes. Exactly, which was, not, which was not warranted. So to me, the, the challenge for, either for Mr. Obama or for, his, uh, for the Republican, uh, whoever wins the, the election, is going to be to implement a, not simply voice, but implement a real policy uh, of restoration here at home. If we don't do that, it will be bad for our society, it will be bad for our economy, and ultimately it will be bad for our foreign policy. We cannot act consistently, much less lead in the world, unless we've got a foundation of economic strength. From that flows everything else. Well, uh, Richard Haas, we have to wrap up. This has just been marvelous, and uh, probably many more things we could cover. Uh, but I have a question for you, and the question is, is restoration going to be the new containment? Uh, I believe it will. Whether people use the word or not, I believe restoration will be the dominant foreign policy for the next decade or so for the United States. The dominant foreign policy for the next decade. Richard Haas, thank you so much for coming by. Thanks, Jim. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more on the digital age. Please visit our website at www.digitalage.org. For the digital age, I'm Jim Zirin. Good night and all the best.